Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Anatomy and Physiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. If you're watching these videos, you're either A, in my class, and you're watching them so that you can get ready for my exams, or B, you stumbled across them on the internet. We're in the coronavirus shutdown, so I've migrated all my lectures to online using these YouTube videos for my students. So these videos are intended for use by my students, and I want, it's presented in a way that I want them to learn the material for now. I don't always get into all the complex details early on. We will add complexity as time goes on. I want people to have solid understanding. Too much information too soon can turn people off. If you're not in my class, please learn the material the way that your instructor presents it. And make sure you cover all the material in your lectures and in your textbook. If you are in my class, please read the textbook along with studying the notes in my note set. So if you're following along in my note set, folks, at this point we're on page 16, we're going to talk about membrane permeability. The last video we talked about the structure of the cell membrane. So we're going to go over membrane permeability. The cell membrane for our cells is said to be what we call semi-permeable or selectively permeable. Semi-permeable or selectively permeable means some things can enter and exit the cell, but other things may not. If the cell were freely permeable, Anything could penetrate the cell or exit the cell. We don't want to lose valuable proteins and nutrients and sugars, and we don't want to lose um, ribosomes and all the organelles. We also don't want to toxins and dirt and debris getting into the cell, although it can happen from time to time. Thank goodness for lysosomes, right? Now, um, the cell cannot be impermeable. Impermeable means it's not permeable. That means nothing can enter the cell. We couldn't get sugars and amino acids and lipids in for growth and repair and energy production. And we couldn't get trash and waste and debris out. So our cell membranes are said to be selectively or semi-permeable, okay? Means some substances can enter the cell while others can't. Some substances can exit the cell while others can't. Now, when we talk about transport, we're gonna talk about two types of transport within the cell. Pardon my back, but I'm teaching this as if y'all were standing in my classroom. Uh, I'm old school, I don't have all the technology or the knowledge of how to edit and make this all nice and slick like some people. I'm learning it, but it's a slow process. Anyway, so when we talk about cellular transport, to transport something simply means it's going to be moved around. And we're gonna move stuff within our cell and into and out of the cell by these transport processes. All of the transport processes can fall under one of two major categories. We can call it passive transport, Well, we can talk about active transport. In passive transport, it does not require the cell to expend energy for that movement to occur. It's passive, it's just going to happen. In active transport, this requires the cell to burn or expend energy to move substances. And I'm gonna leave it a little bit blank, blank, uh, vague here or some blanks here because it can move substances within the cell or into or out of the cell. So anytime we talk about a passive process, it means it doesn't require any cell energy. Usually the cell is not gonna burn any ATP to make it happen. If we talk about an active process, that means it requires a cell to burn energy. And the energy we're talking about is ATP. We're going to talk a little bit more about ATP when the time is appropriate, okay? So if you're following along in my note set on page 16, we start off with the passive processes. So I'm not going to talk about active transport right now. I'm only going to talk about the types of passive transport for the moment. And this stuff kind of trips people up. And I can be honest with you, when I was a student in high school learning this, taking some biology courses in high school, and even when I got to college, I was really good at memorizing definitions and, and regurgitating it and making an A, but not really, not, not really learning the information at a deep level. I call that information bulimia. You cram it in, you puke it out on the test, but you gain no knowledge from it. You need to understand these concepts because these concepts are one of the major topics in anatomy and physiology that are gonna stick with you always and forever, and even when you're doing your healthcare, how substances are crossing membranes and moving around inside the body. So when it comes to passive transport, 
there's a couple of major definitions you need to know. Okay? One of those definitions, and you absolutely must know this definition, is diffusion. Those are F's, even though they might look like P's. Okay? Diffusion, you must know this definition. Okay? This is the passive movement of a substance from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Okay? You've got to write this out. You've got to be able to write this from memory. You better burn this into your brain. It's going to be on your exam. Okay? Diffusion is the passive movement of any substance from an area of high substance concentration to an area of low substance concentration. Now, when we're talking about these substances, we usually talk about a solution. And in a previous video, I described the differences between solutions, solutes, and solvents. Again, a solution is a uniform mixture of a solute and a solvent. A solute is anything dissolved into a solution. The solvent is anything that a solute is dissolved into. So if I was gonna make Kool-Aid, the water would be the solvent the powder would be the solute that gets dissolved into it. Once it's mixed, it would be a Kool-Aid solution, so to speak. Or if I put salt in water, I would have a salt solution or sugar in water. Sugar being the solute, water being the solvent. The sugar and water would become the sugar solution. So when I take any substance, here's how I like to think about this, okay? Let's say I have two areas I take a big fish tank and I put a little semi-permeable membrane, a membrane that has tiny holes in it to separate it into two sides. We can call this say side A and side B. Let's say I take some substance, it doesn't matter what it is, it could be sugar, it could be salt, it could be potassium permanganate, um, calcium chloride, any substance, Kool-Aid, I don't know, purple dye. If I put a whole bunch of this substance on one side, let's say this side becomes 9% of whatever that substance is. We're just going to say 9% sodium chloride or table salt, okay? So that means it's 91% water. Unless I tell you otherwise, 100% of the solution, if 9% of it is something, the other 91% has to be water, unless I give you any additional information. Now, let's say on this side, I have 3% sodium chloride. Now I have a side that has a high concentration and an area that has a low concentration. And I have essentially set up a concentration gradient that looks like this. This side is much higher in salt concentration than this side. You can even see the slope and predict if this membrane is permeable to that salt or whatever that substance is, could be anything, oxygen, carbon dioxide, um, sodium bicarbonate, potassium permanganate, sodium chloride, sugar, doesn't matter. I can predict that this substance will move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. And as the substance starts to move across, eventually, the concentration on this side will go down as the concentration on this side goes up until they reach an equilibrium, until they would both be about 6% sodium chloride. It will only happen if this membrane is permeable to the salt, but if it is, the salt is going to move and we can predict which direction it will move. So let's say on an exam I gave you a question that says, you have two solutions separated by a semi-permeable membrane. Side A is 9% sodium chloride. Side B is 3% sodium chloride. And that membrane is permeable to sodium chloride. Which of the following would occur? A, water would move from side A to side B. B, water would move from side B to side A. C, salt would move from side A to side B. D, Water would, uh, salt would move from side B to side A, or E, none of the above, or all of the above, or something. 
Well, the answer would be the solution would move or the salt would move from side B to side A if that membrane's permeable and I have to include that in the question. You need to be able to think your way through that and understand what's going to move and where and why. Okay? Now, the movement of the substance from side B to side A would be called diffusion. So if I wrote a question that said two substances separated by a semi-permeable membrane, side A is 9% salt, side B is 3% salt, the membrane is permeable to the salt so that the salt moves from the high concentration to the low concentration. What is the definition of the movement of that salt? Diffusion. It's all that it's looking for. Okay. So be able to understand the concept of diffusion. Okay. Now, I'm going to leave this part up, but I'm going to change this. There's another definition called osmosis. Os osmosis is the passive movement of, we're going to change one word in this sentence. And I'm going to change it up just a little bit. It's the passive movement of water from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. Now let me be clear here before I go any further. This is not how textbooks write it, but I'm going to explain that in a second. This is how my brain, my simple little mind, can make sense of it. So if I'm looking at the same setup, and I know that this is salt on both sides, and everything else must be in here, water. That means this side is 91% water. This side is 97% water. So my water concentration is the opposite of my solute concentration. And water could move from high water to low water concentration. And it will. And it, the complex part of this that I don't want to get into too much detail on is this. If this membrane is permeable to salt, initially salt and water are going to be moving until they reach an equilibrium. But if we took a snapshot of it, we walked away and came back and took another snapshot, if this membrane is permeable to the salt, it's going to look like the salt moved and the water didn't. So diffusion has occurred. Now, what if this membrane is not permeable to the salt? Mother Nature still wants to try to balance them out and make them equal in some respects. If the salt cannot move, the water will in the opposite direction. And what will happen is some of the water will be pulled across the membrane here so that the water level here goes down and this one goes up until they reach an equilibrium. And the movement of water is called osmosis. The passive movement of water is called osmosis. And it's going to move from an area of high water concentration to an area of lower water concentration. And that movement is called osmosis. Now, how do you keep all of this straight? I think of it this way. If diffusion can occur, it will, and we can predict the direction it would move. If diffusion cannot occur, osmosis will, usually, in the opposite direction. So think about that and write that down. If diffusion can occur, it will, and we can predict, it will go from high to low. If diffusion cannot occur, usually osmosis will in the opposite direction. So if you understand diffusion, you understand osmosis. The only difference is osmosis is the movement of water, and the water will move in the opposite direction that osmosis, I'm sorry, that diffusion would have occurred in. Now the way your textbook writes it is this. Osmosis is the passive movement of water from an area of low solute concentration. Well, this is low solute or high water. This is high solute and low water. So textbooks always write, osmosis is the passive movement of water from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. Low, high. I like to think of it as, where's the water higher? The water will move from high water to low water concentration, which would be from low solute to high solute. That confuses a lot of people, and I get it. So learn it however you need to learn it. 
And I know some people in biology and chemistry don't like that I teach it this way, but I can tell you that I had never, once I figured this out and came up with this little saying in my head, I've never missed a question on osmosis and diffusion for the rest of my life. So you guys need to understand a few things. If I give you a scenario similar to this, you need to know the properties of the membrane. If the membrane is permeable to whatever the solute is, the solute will move from high to low concentration. If the membrane is not permeable to that solute, water will move in the opposite direction, from high water to low water, or low solute to high solute. One of the things we say in science is that water will follow the solute. Wherever the solute moves, the water will follow. If there's a high solute concentration over here, water goes there. If there's a high solute concentration over here, water goes with it, okay? So I hope you understand these concepts of osmosis and diffusion, okay? Um, one other topic I want to discuss, and we'll cut this video off. There's a thing called um, uh, facilitated diffusion. And if you look at this word, facilitate means to help. So anytime something is facilitated, that means it is helped. It comes from facility or when we talk about teachers, we talk about the faculty. We help you learn. We're facilitating the learning process, okay? So facilitated diffusion is simply this. Facilitated diffusion, and I'm not going to write it out. You can follow my words or you can look it up. Facilitated diffusion is the passive movement of a substance that requires the presence of another substance in order to diffuse. Basically, the second substance helps the first one diffuse. It's kind of like if you have a roommate in college, but you don't have a car and your roommate does, when do you go grocery shopping? Whenever your roommate goes, they facilitate your movement. They're facilitating your diffusion. So in facilitated diffusion, it's the passive movement of a substance that requires the presence of another substance in order to move. Okay. Now, we're done with osmosis and diffusion, I believe. Let me double check the notes set. I want to make sure I don't skip anything that's in here. Um, I kind of do things a little bit differently, and um, I rewrote my note set. Or I'm in the process of rewriting it, and I'm using the old one before the new one's published. We talk about osmosis on page 17. Oh, and before I go anywhere, I need to talk about these terms and explain why they're important. We're going to talk about tonicity. Well, we discussed tonicity. Tonicity simply means the concentration... of a solute in solution. So if I have 10% sodium chloride, then the tonicity of that solution is 10% sodium chloride. If it's 25% potassium permanganate, that's the tonicity of that solution, okay? And that leads us to these terms that we're gonna discuss. One of these terms is the term hypertonic. Now, hyper always means more than or an increase. So if I have a substance that is hypertonic, that means that substance has a higher concentration than whatever we compare it to. And this is not really the technical definition, as you can tell. But when something is hypertonic, that means it has a higher concentration than whatever we're talking about. For example, if I have two buckets of water here, and I tell you this bucket is 10% sodium chloride, and this one is hypertonic, then what do you know about this solution? It must have a concentration that is higher than 10% sodium chloride. It might be 11%, 12%, 22%, 98%, I don't know, some concentration higher than this. That's all that that means, okay? If I told you that we're going to use the term hypotonic. Oops. Hypo means below or under. So this means it has a lower concentration than whatever we're comparing it to. So if I told you that this solution is hypotonic to this one, 
then we know that the concentration of salt in this solution is less than 10%. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, whatever. It would be hypotonic, okay? Now there's another word or another term that is iso. Iso means same. This means lower. This means higher, right? So an isotonic solution has the same concentration than whatever we compare it to. We're just changing one word in our definition. Hypertonic solution is a solution that has a higher concentration of solute than whatever we're comparing it to. Hypotonic means it has a lower concentration of solute than whatever we compare it to. And isotonic means it has the same concentration of solute than whatever we compare it to. So if I have two buckets of water, and I say that this one is 12% glucose. And I have another bucket of solution that is isotonic. What do we know about this solution? It's 12% glucose. Make sense? Now, why is this important? Why do we need to know these terms? And why, why do we care about osmosis and diffusion and all of that? Well, it's one of the fundamental principles that you have to understand to get through AMP. And we will come back to it over and over and over again in part one and part two AMP and when you become a healthcare professional. So here's why it's important. Okay. I'm going to talk about a red blood cell. The technical term for a red blood cell, we refer to red blood cell as an RBC. Okay? But they're also called erythrocytes. Erythrocytes or red blood cells. If I were to look inside of a red blood cell, I know that the concentration of salt inside of a red blood cell is 0.9% sodium chloride, NaCl. 0.9 or 9 tenths of 1%. It's actually kind of close. It's about 0 0.85, 0 0.9, somewhere in there. So now, red blood cells have a very specific shape to them. They're often described as a biconcave disc. So if I could cut it in half, it's a little more narrow in the middle than it is on the edges in a big circle. It's almost as if you took a biscuit out of a can of biscuits and you just push the inside down and squeeze it so that they're curved in all the way around. We call that a biconcave disc. Now, one of the main functions of red blood cells is that red blood cells are delivering oxygen to our cells and they help remove carbon dioxide in a number of ways. And as you guys might know, my cells, if I have a cell over here, inside the cell is an organelle called the mitochondrion. I'm just gonna put mito here for mitochondrion talked about in previous lectures. My cells have to take glucose and they have to take oxygen and they run them through some enzymes and they spit out 36 molecules of ATP, which is a lot of energy from one molecule of glucose. <coughs> now, in the process, they make some waste called carbon dioxide. So we need oxygen to make energy. Without the oxygen, I don't make enough energy, my cells die. If carbon dioxide builds up, they can enter into some dangerous chemical reactions and kill me. What red blood cells do is this. They go to our lungs and fill up with oxygen. They go to our cells and they deliver the oxygen to the cells and pick up the carbon dioxide. They go back to the lungs and release the carbon dioxide and fill up with oxygen again. So they literally just circulate, delivering oxygen and removing carbon dioxide. Deliver oxygen, remove carbon dioxide. And there are some blood vessels that are so small that our red blood cells line up in single file line. Actually, they use a French word to describe this, which is called rouleau, little rolls, rows of, uh, of these red blood cells. If something happened to a red blood cell, let's say a red blood cell changes shape and gets hung up on the wall here, it's going to create a traffic jam. And then now I can't deliver any oxygen and blood to this cell. I cut off the oxygen supply. I cut off the energy production. The cell could die. I don't want my red blood cells changing shape 
and getting stuck in the walls of the blood vessels. I also don't want them to pop because then there's no oxygen to carry. So this is why osmosis and diffusion and tonicity is important, okay? Let's say I take my red blood cell and I'm gonna stick it in a bucket of water. If I told you that this solution is hypertonic to the red blood cell, you know that this solution has a concentration of salt that is greater than 0.9%. Let's say this is 5% sodium chloride. It's salt water. What's going to happen is this. Outside the cell, I have a higher concentration. If you don't know this, these little squared off brackets in chemistry mean the concentration of whatever's inside there. But I have a higher concentration of sodium chloride outside the cell than I do inside the cell. 5%. 0.9%. If the sodium chloride could move, it would go from outside the cell to inside the cell. It would diffuse. Here's something that you should know, and don't forget this. That red blood cell membrane is not permeable to sodium chloride. So what's going to happen if the salt cannot move? Water will move in the opposite direction. So if you place a red blood cell in salty water, it will draw the water out of it, shrivel it up, and the red blood cell will eventually go and look like this. It will start to shrivel up. And we call that crenation. Crenation is defined as the shriveling of a red blood cell when placed in a hypertonic solution. Write that down. It's the shriveling of a red blood cell when placed in a hypertonic solution. And every time we do this experiment, you take some red blood cells and put them in salt water, they all start to shrivel up because the salt will pull the water out of the red blood cell. A crenated red blood cell can get stuck to the walls of a blood vessel and stop the delivery of oxygen to our cells. So you don't wanna put a lot of salt. This is why consuming too much salt or becoming dehydrated could kill you. You don't want that to happen, okay? Now, what if I take the exact same scenario, but I switch this up? What if I tell you that this solution is going to be 0.2%, two tenths of 1%. So now my solution is hypotonic to the red blood cell. Now I've messed up all of this. And now I have my concentration of salt outside the cell is lower than inside. The salt wants to move out of the cell. Again, red blood cells are impermeable to sodium chloride. They are permeable to oxygen, they are permeable to carbon dioxide, and they are permeable to water. And until I tell you otherwise, that's all they're permeable to. So what that means is, since the salt can't exit the cell, water will enter the cell. And if they start to move too much water into the cell, the cell will start to swell up and rupture. And when a red blood cell is placed in a hypotonic solution, they will rupture. And we call that process hemolysis. Hemo means blood and lysis means to rupture or break or digest. And every time I put red blood cells in a hypotonic enough solution, they swell up and pop. When they pop, they can't deliver oxygen to our cells and you could die. This is why the overconsumption of water and not releasing it through urination can also be bad for you. Dehydration and overhydration can both be bad. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to put salt water and you don't want to put pure water in someone's IV. You could kill them. Now there are some specialized instances where you may have to do certain things but we're not gonna do that right now. So if you understand hypertonic, and I place a red blood cell, you should know that concentration. You should know red blood cells are only permeable to salt, I mean, sorry, to water, not salt, water, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. There are a few other things they're permeable to, but I'm not gonna tell you what they are now. We'll do that when we do blood. If I place a red blood cell in a hypertonic solution, every time it shrivels up because of osmosis. 
If I place it in a hypotonic solution, they rupture, they hemolyze or rupture every time. Now, what if I told you that this solution is isotonic to the red blood cell? Then it's going to be 0.9% sodium chloride. Is the red blood cell going to rupture? Is it going to gain water or lose water? And it's none of that. They're going to stay normal. So when you become a healthcare professional and you start someone's IV, there are different IV bags, and some of them are color-coded with the writing on them that means something to you. And most of the IV bags are called normal or physiological saline. Saline meaning salt solution. If it's physiological saline, it is isotonic to your red blood cells. Then you can run that solution in someone's veins, and it's not going to damage their red blood cells. But if you accidentally grab the wrong bag and don't read the label, and you hang pure water up and run it in someone's IV, you could hemolyze their cells if they become, if you make their, their um, plasma hypotonic. The red blood cells will shrivel up and rupture, and it could kill the patient because you're not going to deliver oxygen. If you go and grab 5% saline, which exists in hospitals, and you put the wrong IV bag up and hook it into a patient, then you can cause the red blood cells to shrivel, and you could do some severe damage to a patient, if not kill them. So you always have to pay attention to detail. You always have to understand the whys behind what you're doing or else you're not gonna have a high paying job. So, understand osmosis, diffusion, know the definition of facilitated diffusion, be able to predict what's gonna happen when, know the definitions of hyper, hypo, and isotonic, and know what happens to a red blood cell if I place it in a hypertonic solution, a hypotonic solution, or an isotonic solution, and you'll understand a lot of important concepts for your future. Now, I hope you had as much fun as I did learning this, um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Now do it till you can't stand it. Do it till you understand it. Do it a few more times until you can explain it to someone else without looking at your notes and you'll be ready for a test. Thanks for watching.